kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Oh boy, this blind commentary has been doing so well. Oh my, I need to move that. Anyway, I have to be honest, guys. This I have to give you guys so much credit for this series because I have never seen such great, great stuff, you know, from you guys. Like, um, first off, I'd like to little give a shout out to Oscar who commented that the Alucorns were the Super Mutants, and I th thank you for shedding light on my confusion. So, I thank you so much for that. Also, thank you for also, um, thank you, Oscar, for putting a little bits of poetry after each video, w during each video, which I really loved, and I've been k taking note of those poetries, you know, and, um, like, seriously, those are some, that <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Anyway, today's chapter is called The Moral of the Story, where we left off, where my confusion is, what the hell is going on? I don't want to know. Anyway, the the point of the matter is, where we left off was where Little Pip had um, forcefully told um, a watcher to call for help. And they had just crossed the train, and things just kind of went from hell. And wow. I, I was, at the end of it, I was kind of left emotionally crippled. And like, holy shit, I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I got into this. So, K-Cat, holy fuck. <laughs> Damn. Anyway, let's get into it. Clowns. When I first stepped outside into this new world, the world was impossibly big. The sky terrifyingly high. Now, the omnipresent clouds, shifting, boiling, and darkening with rain, was just another ceiling. Gray like the one in stable maintenance. Only rarely, like on that first night, would small fissures open in the cloud cover, like gaping wounds that would slowly heal. The tantalizing glimpse of a bright, wondrous blue above, cheerful and serene, tempted and tortured those living in gloom below. A little pip, Velvet asked, her own thoughts not far from my own. Does the air seem strange to you outside? The day is so warm and bright, and yet the air is sickly. I feel so eager and yet so hesitant to be enwrapped by it. Like it's poisonous, I agreed. Calamity said nothing. I suppose that to him the air was the air, and it had always been like this. The strewn wreckage of Pegasus' vehicles, cast from the sky when the metropolis of Cloudsdale was obliterated in a single hoof stop, stretched on for miles. Some of the sky chariots and wagons are marred further with the old skeletons of the poor ponies who were struck dead or mortally wounded by the mega spell, but whose bodies were not wiped from existence entirely. The mountains rose up to either side of the valley, sickly grass forested with blackened trees. New plants grew around them, feeding on their corpses. Up and ahead was the worn and faded image of a giant sparkle cola bottle, the stylized carrot immediately identifying the drink, even though the words on the sign had faded too severely to read. A badly faded yellow pony with a pink... I have to say, this scene reminds me from when I play Fallout 4, is that when you leave the vault, that you notice all these dead bodies laying around, like just skeletons of the people that you used to know. Like, holy shit, you know? Even, like, the skeletons of the people who lived in the vault were there, where you get your Pip-Boy and stuff. That's what this is reminding me of. Main was holding it aloft in nearly orgasmic glee. According to Calamity, these giant signs, oh, called crap. billboards, had once littered every major sky route between Cloudsdale and other cities, advertising goods and services from all over Equestria. I could spot a second billboard on the opposite side of the valley, perhaps half a mile further down. Even at this range, I thought I could recognize the familiar image of the heroic pegasi with rainbows exploding across the sky behind them as they swooped over the armies of wicked zebras. Better wiped than striped. A large enclosed delivery wagon lay battered, banked, and sunken partially into the ground. I spotted on its side what appeared to be a business logo, a pattern of seven ascending circles which struck me as strangely familiar. I didn't have to ponder it too long, for as we drew closer... Ugh, God damn it! sorry guys, I'm having a little... Having a little technical difficulty. My pit bucks automatic christened it wreckage of ditzy do deliveries. Now I remembered where I had seen this pattern before, on the interior title page of the Wasteland Survival Guide. Calamity was looking at the wreckage with similar comprehension. Velvet looked between us, confused at why we had stopped to stare. What? This is where Ditsy Do fell, I said, feeling awe and intense sadness. 
this this would have been her only grave marker had she not suffered a stranger fate. Who did she do? I repeated, lost in my own thoughts. I was trying to imagine what it had been like. Velvet, who did not know the name, gave me a look indicating just how helpful she felt that answer was, and turned to Calamity. Yep. Velvet nickered and walked past, circling around the back. Moments later, I heard her call out. Little Pip, would you please come to look at this? Her voice was a tone of... Hope? I trotted around to find her, not at all like a little puppy at her owner's call. Boxes and crates littered the ground around the back of the Ditsu delivery's wagon. And many more were toppled and crushed inside. Some had been torn open, all had been looted for anything of value. Except, that was, for a safe and a footlocker in the back. It was the latter which had drawn Velvet's excitement because, while identical and make to every other footlocker I had run across, the markings were very distinct. Three bands of yellow, the center one with a pink butterfly emblem. This was not a medical box, but the colors and the symbol were clearly those of the Ministry of Peace. Sure, no problem, I announced proudly, floating out my screwdriver and bobby pin as I watched Velvet struggling not to prance in anticipation. Turning away, I started on picking the lock on the safe first. I could hear her stomp her hoof and bit my lower lip to stifle a laugh. The safe's lock gave up almost too easily. Considering the level of looting, I was surprised that such a weak lock had been such a long-lived deterrent. Was I the only one outside who had developed this skill? I opened the safe. One item inside immediately captured my attention. The entire interior of the safe was filled with a rosy glow emanating from a bottle of luminescent purplish-red liquid. Sparkle Cola. Rad. With an invigorating touch of radiation and a blast of radish flavoring. It's like a buck to the face. With radishes. The Sparkle Cola Rad floated out of the safe past me, enveloped in a magical glow by Velvet's horn. Raising the bottle to eye level, she winced at it with a disparaging glance. That's insane. How could any pony be so stupid as to think consuming radiation is healthy? My own levitation abilities had been so overstrained that it actually took effort to snatch the bottle back, but I proudly kept myself from panting. Velvet Remedy stared in something approaching horror as she saw me slip the bottle into one of my saddlebags. You're not actually intending to drink that, are you? I shrugged. It did sound like it might be tasty, and according to my pit buck, the radiation still present was minor enough to be washed away with a Radaway potion later. I turned to the footlocker, prompting Velvet to forget, or at least ignore, the beverage in my saddlebags. This lock was not easy. It selfishly refused to give up its secrets. After the third try, I began to worry that this one was beyond me, and I desperately did not want to see Velvet Remedy see me fail. I had one other option, but I didn't want her to see that either. This is a tough one. I'm gonna need concentration. Velvet, could you step out? And considering her warning earlier, I added, Please? I could tell she didn't want to, but with ladylike grace, she departed. I could tell she didn't want to, but with ladylike grace, she departed. As soon as she was out of sight, I brought up my pit buck sorting spell and pulled out the tin of mint house from the I had hidden in the bottom of my pack. This wasn't the incredible party time treat I had before, but I didn't need to talk to the locker. Opening the tin, I popped one into my mouth and began to chew. The effect was immediate. It was like a gray film was being washed away from all of my senses, like my mind was seen clearly after having been in a deep fog. I was feeling more alive and aware than ever before. This wasn't party time, and definitely not as candylicious, but it was enough to make the damn lock sing for me. Outside, I could hear Velvet Remedy's voice. Calamity, may I ask you something? Oh, yep, I reckon you can. Why is it that you are the only Pegasus Pony I've seen in the Equestrian Wasteland? I was under the impression that the Pegasus Ponies would be as common as Earth and Unicorn Ponies. My ears perked. Their conversation wasn't meant to be private, so this wasn't eavesdropping exactly. And I had to admit, I wanted to know that too. There was a pregnant pause. Then Calamity nickered. Wow, lady, when you ask a question, you go right for the throat, don't you? I'm sorry, I apologize if this is personal. No, no, you should know, I guess. I could hear Calamity sigh. My perceptiveness was heightened to an amazing degree. As I had predicted, the lock was now easy, and clicked open and surrender. You ain't gonna find any other Pegasus ponies. Not unless they're... like me. He paused as if speaking about it was physically taxing. You see, back during the war, we Pegasus ponies were Equestria's greatest fighting force. We were the elites. The best of the best. But, after Cloudsdale was hit, well, that was it. Game over. They abandoned the war, abandoned Equestria. Although it's not like either one of them had lasted longer than a few hours past that anyhow. Pegasus ponies closed up the sky and went up to hiding. Closed up 
the sky. Yep. They kicked up the cloud makers to full power and locked them like that. Saved their cities, their families. Zebras couldn't well target what they couldn't see. Not that they didn't try. Got a few lucky hits, but not many. I could hear one of them dig around at the ground with a hoof. Ain't been a day that ain't been at least mostly cloudy in Equestria since. Velvet Remedy gasped. That. That's horrible. Oh, they keep telling themselves that any day now they'll turn them off, open up the sky, and come swooping down to save the rest of you. When they're ready. When the time is right. Calamity nickered in clear contempt. Been telling themselves that for upwards of 200 years now. Truth is, they're too arrogant and lazy to bother. As long as they can keep telling themselves that they'll do the right thing eventually, they can live with themselves. Meanwhile, y'all are dying around here from slavers and raiders and monsters. You're making a damn hard effort of saving yourselves without their help. Sounded more like the Pegasus ponies were scared. Hey. Okay, that kind of reminds me of Vault 101. How they locked themselves away and never wanted to get out. Kind of like what Little Pip's Vault was. You know, Vault uh, uh, Stable 2. The, that's... It's kind of... Odd. I have to say. I opened the footlocker and started looking at the items inside. And you? Velvet asked. I didn't find living with myself so easy as that lot seemed to. Bunch of winged horse apples. Wow, Calamity. So very glad to have you on Equestria's side, but bitter much? A few moments later, Velvet trotted back into the delivery wagon. She spared a glance back in Calamity's direction, then noticed I'd opened the footlocker. With a pleased sound, she virtually danced over to the debris to reach me. Inside, numerous scrolls ruined by a bottle of something and shattered. And the glass shards of said bottle, a framed picture of a bunny rabbit, a small crystal orb sealed in a clear bag, property of the Ministry of Peace, restricted viewing only, unauthorized viewers will be prosecuted, and a book, Supernaturals. Whew! Velvet gasped and made a sound that I felt could fairly describe as a squee. I watched her, the corners of my mouth twitching upwards as I realized that Velvet Remedy, the amazing unicorn of unparalleled beauty and musical grace who had inspired at least 300 fans, was herself more than a little bit of a fan filly. I know what this is, Velvet announced, floating the bag with the orb up for closer inspection. It's a memory orb, used to record events not only with sound but moving picture. Much better than a recorder or a camera. Rare, too. Velvet collected the memory orb in the bunny photo. I was surprised when she left the book. Oh, I already have that one. But you should take it, little Pip. I know you'll find it useful. Something in her expression made me think that there was a joke here, at my expense. Still, I wasn't one to turn down a book, especially if it was one Velvet Remedy suggested. I'd just finished sliding the, the book into my saddlebags when my eyes forward sparkle compass exploded with red. I froze. Crap, that's a lot of enemies. In my mind, I knew the slavers had found us again. And from the looks of things, they'd brought an army. Little Pip. What is it? Anxiously, I whispered. Go get Calamity. Quietly. Please. I turned slowly in place. There was a gap in the red. We weren't entirely surrounded. Trouble. And more than we could handle. Velvet immediately tensed, nodded nervously, and trotted out as quickly and quietly as she could, only knocking over one crate along the way. We both winced. As she reached the back end of the wagon, she stopped, aghast. Zombie ponies! What? Not slavers. I moved up next to her. I was already forming how I was going to explain to her about ghouls, but the words died on my lips as I took in the blank, hungry stares and shambling, grotesque movements of the approaching herd. These did not look like ghouls. These looked like zombie ponies. I remembered the warning. You get into the wrong places, you'll find yourself hunted by whole packs of cannibal ghoul ponies gone zombie. Moving closer to Calamity, I whispered, Follow me. We watched them shuffle a foot nearer. Two. The closest zombie pony broke into a slavering charge. Run! We ran. Ran like we were being chased by a mindless horde of monsters intent on eating us alive. Because we were. The zombie ponies exploded into action, joining the hunt, our flesh the prize they were after. Many launched into the air and flew towards us. I tried to telekinetically grab a downed sky chariot as we raced past, but the glow around my horn sparked and died. I had no telekinetic tricks to save us. Velvet Remedy shrieked as a zombie pony dove from the sky. She ducked, the creature overshooting her and crashing into a tree. I leapt over the body and kept going, my side beginning to hurt. That hurt swiftly grew into burning coals buried in my side, bringing tears to my eyes and threatening to sap my strength. Two more zombie ponies dived towards us. 
Calamity, wide-eyed in fear, suddenly scowled and spat out, Ah, screw this! He skidded to a halt, rearing around and opened fire. The shot ripped the featherless wing off one zombie, causing it to lurch into another. The two tumbled out of the sky in a spin, splashing gorily onto a half-buried metal skeleton of a huge wagon designed to carry smaller wagons. Ahead, the rusted hulk of a long passenger chariot rose out of the ground like a barricade. Launching himself into the air, Calamity yelled for us to go around it and keep running. Don't slow down, not for an instant, he cried out as he dodged another flying zombie pony, kicking his saddle to reload. Velvet was pulling ahead of me, my shorter legs and burning side threatening to spell out a most horrific death for me. Velvet tore around the side of the passenger wagon and disappeared behind it. I could hear the herd right at my tail, hooves thundering over the ground in a hungry stampede, foul breath hitting my mane. I couldn't make the turn. They'd be on me if I tried. Hoping that my small size would come to my aid for once, I instead leapt for one of the shattered, gaping windows. My body, saddlebags and all, sailed cleanly through the opening. I hit one of the benches inside and jumped for the opposite window without breaking speed. Jagged shards of glass cut up my neck and legs, slashing into my armor before snapping away as my saddlebags hit them. I was out again, and almost clear when the strap of my sniper rifle caught onto a piece of jagged metal and I was jerked to a halt, swinging back into the wagon's side with a jarring thud. I was caught. I tried to pull away, but my hooves barely brushed the ground. I could hear the hoofbeat of a multitude of zombie ponies as they reached the long body of the wagon, the herd splitting to go around either side. I twisted about, trying to bite the strap loose before they were on top of me. Somewhere above, I heard Calamity taking shots. I heard the metal of the wagon dent and puncture, his hits for once not striking the enemy. Panic flared through me. If the zombie ponies didn't get me, one of Calamity's wild shots might. Terribly, I realized how preferable a fate that would be, and I prayed that Celestia would grant him the wisdom and mercy to shoot me if they started eating me. With a final strong bite, the strap broke, and I fell free. Instinctively, I grasped the sniper rifle in my teeth, realizing only later how foolish a waste of a precious second that was, and I ran as hard as my screaming legs and side would let me. The zombie herd was already coming around the passenger wagon and closing in on me. Their hooves brutalized the discolored grass beneath. Even more swooped over it with an ease that made my shortcut laughable. My clear mind and heightened perceptions had become pure terror. I could feel the ground tremble beneath me. I could calculate how swiftly they would be gnawing on my hide. I could make out a strange, faint pop, even through the rumble of the herd. I could feel myself lifted into the air as the wreckage of the passenger wagon was consumed in a flare of unleashed wild magic. I could see the pulsing cascade of colors cast strange shadows as swirling magical energies erupted through the air. I could smell the fetid corpse stench of the zombies as they were blown apart, even as their body parts caught fire. I hit the ground, still running, the valley lurching about as I fought to keep from tumbling. Bits of zombie pony flattered down about me like rain. Ahead of me, Velvet Remedy had stopped and was just staring, eyes fixed on a scene behind me that I preferred not to imagine. Most of the herd was killed in the blast, and many who were not had scattered, but not for long. Calamity swooped over me, crying out for a panting Velvet to turn back around and keep running. A cluster of odd sky vehicles, painted in mottled light blue and gray with tiny splashes of white, formed the only possible defensible position. Beyond that, the valley spread out into rolling, rocky hills that offered no cover at all. We reached as more zombie ponies overflew us, landing just yards away. Velvet Remedy lowered her horn, charging at them, and skewered one messily, unable to hold back, and ew, that I just empathized with completely. I tried to grasp Little Macintosh telekinetically, but my magic just couldn't. Desperately, I looked around for something I could grasp in my mouth. A piece of sufficiently spear-like debris would do. What I found was infinitely better. At least, I thought so. As Calamity shot the zombie pony moving towards me, I scrambled over to where the cargo of one of the vehicles had spilled. I had seen it, in small and cruel glimpses, the beautiful light blue sky above the clouds. My mental clear mind quickly realized the paint on these strange sky chariots would have once served as camouflage. A Pegasus military convoy. And, praise Celestia, one of the things they had been transporting was turrets. I was trained to reprogram the spell matrix of a pitbuck. Tweaking a turret to turn off my pitbuck's definitions of friend and foe was comparatively easy. Especially right now. Uh, little pip, you sure you know what you're doing? Calamity asked, sparing me a glance as he landed between me and more zombie ponies, firing again. I was all grins. You betcha. Celestia watch you and keep you safe as you travel down the path you choose. May Luna be with you and keep you strong, so your courage Wait. will never lose. Remain loyal, honest, and brave. Forget not the ones that you save. And in your hearts you will do no wrong. Velvet Remedy soon wove between humming and lyrics, the latter in a state of constant flux. 
For me, watching my idol actually craft a song was amazing. Calamity didn't complain. He too found her music to be uplifting in the bleakness of the wasteland. Although, his occasional eye-rolling suggested he wished she would stick with one set of lyrics rather than seeking perfection. It had been several hours since the zombies in the valley were safely behind us. A darker gray began to seep into the sky again. Not a storm, Calamity said with some encouragement. Just the approach of nightfall. If I ever met the Pegasus ponies, I thought, I'd have to thank them for making the equestrian wasteland so depressing. Somehow, it was worse than the drab monotony of Stable 2, because I never believed that Stable 2 could do better. Although, that could have been the post mental depression talking. Oh my, Velvet gasped as we crested a rolling hill and saw it. An absolutely gigantic billboard, far taller than any of the buildings I'd seen, loomed just beyond the next hill. The image, amazingly unfaded yet marred with the grime and water damage of centuries, was nothing but the giant face of an almost unbearably pink pony, with a mane that age had turned into a candy cane. She was smiling, and her eyes seemed to follow us. Pinkie Pie. I'd seen this before from the train. Even now, recognizable in this light and at this distance as a billboard, it, merciful Celestia, still gave me nervous chill. I stared as I walked Didn't closer, make trying to imagine it before so many decades had taken their toll. Before it had been repeatedly peppered by wind-blown dust and ash, streaked with rivolts of rain. Back when its placement would have been clearly playful, set behind the rays of the hill so it looked like a pony was playing peekaboo with the whole damn countrysides. Back when it wasn't so... Luna damned fucking creepy. I tried to shake off the feeling with a shudder, turning away from the massive billboard, and found myself staring at a sneaky sprite bot. Hello, little pip. I would have been in the next country if Calamity didn't bite my fleeing tail. He held me while I ran in place until the panic left me. By that time, Watcher had wisely floated out of Hoof's reach. You are so lucky I can't telekinetically hurl rocks at you right now. Velvet Remedy looked like she'd help me. Calamity was glaring distrustfully at the sprite bot, wings out, legs spread in defensive stance. Little Pip? All I wanted to know right then was, Watcher, are they safe? The sprite bot bobbed. Yes, wagons are underway. Although Ditsy Do might now be under the impression that you can hack sprite bots and send messages through them. Sorry about that. Lil Pip. Calamity would have been growling if he could. I don't trust that thing. So, Watcher had found a way to relay the message that without alerting the pony folk of New Appaloosa to what Watcher was able to do. At Calamity's words, I realized I really didn't trust Watcher either. And now that I knew the ponies we fought and nearly died to rescue were safe, or soon would be, quite a few more questions tumbled into my mind. First and foremost being, you sent me into that raider pit knowing full well what and who I would find there, didn't you? Calamity broke off staring at the strangely behaving bot, looking to me. I had never told him why I had gone to the Ponyville library. They needed help. You could have told me the truth, I scowled. Hey, I didn't exactly know you, did I? You seemed like a good pony who would do the right thing once I saw it for yourself, but now I felt like growling. You lied to me! No. If it was possible for the toneless mechanical voice to sound heated, it would have. I told you I didn't mean any harm, and I didn't. I told you you would find something you needed to survive in there. The sprite bot flew close. And I'd say you found more valuable things in there than just a book, wouldn't you agree? Damn it. Watcher was right. I found Ditsy Doo, who was an acquaintance I valued far more than the guide she wrote, which I held in fairly high regard. Spinning a mental web, I can make an argument that my friendship with Calamity arose out of what happened there. Possibly, although less firmly, I could say my relationship with the new Appaloosans, and thus my ability to save many more ponies, including Vel Remedy, for certain definitions of saving, stemmed from what Watcher pulled. I still wanted to stuff a hoof through the damn bot's front plate, but I knew it wouldn't do any good. The sprite bot wasn't Watcher. Velvet Remedy spoke up. A little Pip, what's going on here? I told them everything. Whoops, almost out of time, Watcher warned as I finished up my tale. Watcher only rarely commenting. Calamity was still giving the floating bot nasty looks. I organized the questions in my head, prioritizing. Watcher, you seem to know a lot about things. Well, yeah. What were the ministries? I had seen enough references to the ministries scattered in the artifacts of the past that I suspected much information would be helpful for context. I didn't realize that I had just asked what was arguably the most important question of my life. It was, at least, Celestia Tear. Watcher was silent for a while, long enough that I thought our strange pseudo-companion might have winked away again. Watcher's words came slowly, deliberately. Remember when I told you that you should search for your virtue, and I told you about the greatest heroes of Equestria? I nodded. You mentioned them, yes. 
well. Watcher's words came slowly, as if they were painful. The massacre at Littlehorn broke Princess Celestia's heart. After that, nearly midway through the war, Princess Celestia decided she wasn't the right pony to lead Equestria anymore, so she stepped down, abdicating her position to her sister, Princess Luna. I listened in awe. I had never heard the goddesses spoken of about in this way. The war had been devastating, both abroad and at home. Equestria was in severe distress, suffering from troubles within as well as from enemy armies. You can't imagine what it was like back then. Those heroes I told you about? They were six amazing ponies with true hearts and virtuous souls, whose friendship held the power to change the world. Princess Celestia had always been like a mother to them. She saw them, one in particular, as her children. She loved them and wanted to protect them. So Princess Celestia shielded them from the worst of the war, finding quests for them to keep them mostly out of harm's reach, or at least away from the battlefields. Sending them on diplomatic missions to the Griffins and the Buffalo. Things like that. Princess Luna met them for the first time in a much different circumstance. Princess Luna respected them and saw them as her equals, and, I really think, as her saviors. And so when Princess Luna ascended to rule Equestria and fight the war, she called Equestria's most valuable heroes to serve as her personal advisors. She called for the creation of new offices of government, one under each of them, whose job it would be to take their advice and find ways to implement it. And those were the ministries. Yes. I looked around at the bleak, ruined wasteland that had once been the beautiful nation of Equestria. Doesn't look like that went so well. Silence. Then Watcher spoke again. Have you ever heard the old saying, the portal to hell is open with the incantation of good intentions? If there was a moral to their story, I guess that would be it. As night closed in, we approached a farm that seemed largely intact. No animals in the fields, but smoke curled up from the smokestack, and there was a welcoming glow in several of the windows, as well as a light seeping through the cracks around the silo doors. It was just the three of us again, Watcher having vanished with a pop replaced by tinny patriotic music and an oblivious sprite bot. Calamity had kept a wary eye on the bot until it had wandered out of sight. A raven fluttered down, perching on the first of what looked like a row of three planks sticking out of the ground near the edge of a barren pasture. The last plank was smaller and crooked. The last fellow standing up a fence, I presumed. Quickly but carefully, we trotted down the rocky hillside and through the stone-strewn fields to reach the house. We needed a place to sleep, food to eat, and, if possible, medical supplies. The house seemed like it was sent from Celestia herself, assuming the ponies inside didn't shoot us for trespassing. Hanging hope on the hospitality of strangers was unwise in the equestrian wasteland. Okay. Uh, I'm taking time to process what I heard here about the ministries, how Celestia stepped down. It doesn't seem like Celestia would do such a thing. Huh. I, I, that's just, like, confusing me, and it's... I'm not even sure what to think. <clears throat> so what did happen to those six ponies? Did they die in the fallout? What happened to the main six? A creaky windmill with two-thirds of its blades missing squeaked rustily as we passed. Maybe this isn't such a good idea, I began. Just because there was no awful graffiti did not mean the place wasn't full of raiders. Velvet Remedy marched past me. Really, little Pip, you shouldn't sound so jaded. She was raising hoof to knock when the door swung open, bathing us in warm light. Velvet blinked at the empty space in front of her, then looked down to see the filly in the doorway. She was pink. Garishly pink. It was oddly like looking at the face in the giant billboard, only much, much smaller. And younger. And a very imperfect match. It was hard to tell in the light, but she seemed somehow wrong. My eyes first lighted on a rough scar on her head. Like she'd recently fallen head first, possibly at very high speed, and scraped herself up rather badly. The first guess that popped into my head was that she had jumped off the roof of her barn. Trying to fly? My eyes moved to her sides, looking for wings, but she was indeed an earth pony. Then my eyes caught her bare flank. She was young, but not that young. She stood less than a head shorter than me. I knew what it was like to strive for a cutie mark that wouldn't come. My heart went out to her. She had waited longer for hers than even I had, and was still... wait... No. Wait. The wrongness snapped into focus. If I'd been on Mintals, I would have realized it immediately. Her coat wasn't actually her coat. She'd painted herself pink. I looked to Calamity and then Velvet Remedy. From their expressions, they had seen it too, and it didn't sit well with them. Hello, dear, Velvet began. Is your mother... Oh. My. Gosh. The filly jumped up, squealing in delight. Then, just as quickly, she brought a hoof to her mouth, gasping as if in horror. Oh no, you're late! 
I waited for you all day, but now we're closed. Tears welled up in her wide eyes. Velvet Remedy took a step back. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, young one, but we're not. The look of horror dissipated instantly, replaced by a wide grin. Of course you're not. It's as if we ever close. She giggled exuberantly. She ran out of the house, dashing past us, then spun with a suddenly somber expression. You really should hurry, though. Nasty things haunt these fields at night. With that ominous proclamation, she squealed with glee and ran toward the silo. We looked at each other. I was confused, to say the least. Calamity simply shrugged and started trotting after the young pink girl. As we reached the silo, Velvet called out, I'm sorry, sweetie, but we didn't get your name. Oh, the pink filly jumped. Heh, <laughs> of course, sorry, I'm just so excited. You're the first visitors I've had at the museum in, oh, ages. Giggling again. Oh, I'm Pinky Bell. Museum, I asked, raising an eyebrow. Pinky Bell braced herself and pushed open the silo door. The inside of the silo looked like a party had exploded inside of it, and not in a good way. More like a party had ingested a grenade, and the room was splattered with the party gore and party entrails. Welcome to the Pinkie Pie Museum. The girl was practically bouncing. This here is the number one museum in all things Pinkie Pie in all of Equestria. Calamity was shaking his head, but there was a relieved smile on his face. Velvet Remedy gave Calamity a smirk, and he rolled his eyes in return. This was weird, no doubt about it. But no slaver, no raiders, no horrible monsters. A descent Please tell the me this little bizarre was insane. almost a welcome change. Pinky Bell didn't let up, didn't even stop for a breath. And what do you know, you're just in time for the tour. Now where's our tour guide? She better not be sleeping again. Oh wait, it's me! The museum was a single huge room. There wasn't much to tour. But Pinky Bell made a point to stop and show off one item after another, most of them adorned in saggy balloons or vomited all over with confetti. And they danced and danced all day and all night, and the best of all was it was this very asylum where Pinkie Pie as a young filly invented the first party ever and got her cutie mark. Velvet leaned close to me, murmuring. I'm fairly certain that parties have existed for more than 250 years. But Pinkie Bell was clearly on a roll and not about to stop for questions. During the first years of the war, Pinkie Pie traveled all over, throwing parties for equestrian troops about to head into battle. Bring them a taste of their homeland and more importantly bringing them cheer and putting smiles on their faces. Pinkie Bell waved her arms at several easels with framed photographs of Pinkie Pie, dressed in frills and fishnets, dancing on stage in front of nearly a thousand ponies. That is, when she wasn't on super-secret missions for Princess Celestia. She looks a lot smaller in person, I commented back to Velvet, thinking how much less threatening the real pony seemed than the insane billboard just a few miles from this farm. <laughs> Pinkie Pie's only regret was that she couldn't be everywhere helping the troops all the time, although with Dash she could become pretty close. So, of course, Calamity raised a hoof. Dash a friend or dash the drug? Pinky Bell seemed not to notice. Pressing towards a familiar poster, Pinky Bell rambled on, unstoppable. When Princess Luna offered to give Pinky Pie a whole ministry of her own to do whatever she wanted with it, she pounced on the chance. And thus the Ministry of Morale was born. It was the Pinkie Pie is Watching You Forever poster, this one intact. The elderly pink mare was smiling mischievously as if she'd just played a wonderful prank. And with the whole face visible, I swore I caught a curious look in her eyes. I no longer felt guilty with the poster staring at me. Now I felt uncomfortably exposed. A practice twirl took Pinkie Bell to a table covered in a chemistry set and several... samples. Pinkie Pie was always really great at cooking things, and when Princess Luna, boo, declared that drugs that were flooding Equestria from Zebralands were harmful to the people, Pinkie Pie decided that she could prove they could be good, a fun addition to any party. Working day and night, Pinkie Pie concocted a mixture of mint towels and some of her favorite things, creating... Dun dun dun! Party time mint owls. Pinky Bell lifted up a tin, showing them off. I wanted that tin. Pinky Bell set it down next to the chemistry set and continued on. I lost track of her monologue because my mind insisted that I needed to be absolutely sure I remembered where that tin was. By that time, the Ministry of Morale had transformed Pinky into an iconic figure who transcended the boundaries of one pony to become a mystical figure that easily stood alongside Princess Celestia and Princess Luna themselves. Okay, that was just wrong. Little colts and fillies knew that Pinkie Pie was always watching them. She saw everything they ever did. And if they were good little colts and fillies who were nice and friendly, who did their chores and smiled and laughed and never spread seditious lies, then on their birthdays, Pinkie would bring them a wonderful party. Pinkie Bell waved a hoof in warning. But if they were bad little colts and fillies, Pinkie Pie would bring them a rock. What the? I looked to Velvet Remedy in disbelief. Meanwhile, Pinkie Bell had stopped. Her eyes went wide and she sucked in a huge breath and waited. 
One second, two, three, four. Or is this Finally, really... Pinky Bell let out the breath with a disappointed sigh. I'm sorry I thought I felt an impromptu musical number coming on. Velvet Remedy studiously looked elsewhere. Anyway, what I was saying... Oh yeah, how Pinkie Pie brings parties. Velvet turned back to the little filly, a little started. Brings. Dear, you do know that Pinkie Pie is dead, don't you? Pinkie Bell didn't miss a beat. Oh, she's physically dead, but her spirit lives on inside all of us. I watched Velvet Remedy's eyebrows raise. And then she snickered, seeming to accept that on a level I just couldn't. My life face hoofed, Velvet leaned close to Calamity and whispered, I think Pinkie Pie's spirit is a little stalker. I managed to miss most of the rest of the tour because I was trying to come up with a way to talk Pinkie Bell into parting with what was probably a prized part of her collection. But I was snapped back when Pinkie Bell announced that she had something to ask of us. A proposal. It turns out I have the only copy of the recipe for part-time mint house. Okay, I knew that wasn't true. Calamity's friend also had it. But this might be the fastest, easiest way to get it for myself. And why stress over asking for a single tin when I could get the damned recipe? And I'd be willing to share it with you if you can bring me the one piece of the Pinkie Pie Museum collection that I'm missing. A limited edition Pinkie Pie Magical Statuette. Bring it here and I'll throw you the party to end all parties. I shouldn't have made fun, Velvet Remedy was saying as she trotted nervously about the cramped upstairs room that Pinkie Bell had absolutely insisted we stay in for the night. When Pinkie Bell explained that a few sets of very special magical figurines had been crafted to feature the Ministry Mares, my mind had immediately gone to the orange pony statuette with the three apples on her flank. Finding another one like that, one specifically of Pinkie Pie, could be virtually impossible. On the other hoof, Pinkie Bell insisted that the statuettes would have survived even the apocalypse. And really, I'd found one after being outside for roughly, what, a week? Calamity sat on the bed, one ear to the wall as he watched Velvet Fred. That poor filly, she's so terribly sad. Calamity whinnied. Sad? Were you listening to the same little pink painted ball of dash that I was? Then remembering his own earlier confusion, he clarified. The drug. Velvet Remedy stopped. Oh yes, and that poor girl is not happy. Not at all. She hung her head. She's full of pain. Something horrible must have happened to her. Looking at Velvet Remedy, I was once more struck by the scarlet and golden stripes in her silvery white mane again finding them oddly reminiscent of the Ministry of Peace, Pink and Yellow. Only then, I was thinking of it as coincidence or destiny. Now, I wondered if it was more like Pinkie Bell's painted-on pink coat. Velvet caught my stare and seemed to fathom what I was thinking eerily quickly. It's not the same, she insisted quietly. Calamity was paying more attention to the wall. Abruptly, he jumped to his hooves. She's gone, and if you don't want something horrible to happen to us, I suggest we be leaving too. He moved towards the door and pushed on the handle didn't budge. It was locked. Maybe she's just trying to keep us safe from the nasty things that haunt the fields at night? I offered, not really believing. Oh boy, I already feel Elva nervous. Remedy had pushed past me to try the door herself. Now she whinnied. Doesn't matter, we're leaving. This turn from a, locked in a cage. This turn from an action. Calamity had moved to the window and was looking down on the farm below. I reared up, putting my hooves on the ledge, and peered out through the glass. For a moment, I saw nothing. Just the night. Then, a crack of dimly pulsing colored light appeared as Pinkie Bell pushed open the door of the barn just enough to slide through, then pushed it shut behind her. Clammy waited, quiet and still, until the door of the farmhouse opened, casting a rectangle of light across the ground with a Pinkie Bell shape cut out of it. The moment the door closed, he turned and bucked at the window. The crash was terribly loud. The escape would have been treacherous, if not impossible, without a Pegasus pony to fly us down. We started across the farm, crouching low, keeping to the deeper shadows in the darkness. We were creeping alongside the barn when Impulse overtook me and I slipped inside. I later told Velvet Remedy and Calamity that I wasn't sure why I entered the barn, but the truth was I had exactly two reasons. First, the recipe for the party time mint house had not been anywhere in the museum, and I had not spotted it in the house. It could have easily been hidden anywhere, in a book, under a rug, but I was guessing that Pinkie Bell's obsession would not allow her to put it on display, so I was hoping it would be in the barn. Second, that oddly glowing, pulsing light reminded me uncomfortably of the way the passenger wagon had exploded after Calamity shot it. I'd asked Calamity about it later, and he explained that some of the really big sky wagons, like that one which had been designed to carry dozens of ponies, used a magical fuel generated by a spark engine so a single pony could pull it through the air. Like spark batteries, these engines of arcane science still held serious magical energies. Calamity didn't understand it at that level, of course. He just knew that shooting a hole through the magic box in one of those vehicles unleashes one hell of a vortex. Such a vortex was brief and very violent. 
The idea that Pinky Bell might have something akin to that in her barn, possibly a somehow stable or perpetual magical vortex, deeply worried me. What am I looking at? It was small, geometrically shaped with surfaces that seemed to twist through each other. The whole thing was the size of a bushel of apples and swirled with sickly, mesmerizing colors. I could feel it drawing me in. I was losing myself in it. It took physical effort to pull myself away from the thing. Casting my gaze about, I found a safe. The rest of the barn was almost completely barren. I slipped over to it and began to apply the one trait I had which seemed truly unique. The safe popped open with a whisper. Inside was my prize, the party time mint out recipe. But it wasn't mine. I scavenged. I looted the homes of slavers and raiders. But... But this was stealing from some poor young earth pony, not yet a mare. But... Party time mint owls. And really, all I had to do was take it long enough to copy it into my pit buck. It'd be put right back. And that wouldn't really be stealing, right? Except... Pinky Bell was offering it as a reward for helping her with something. And that made it feel like stealing. Like I was just taking a reward I hadn't earned. I sat, staring to the safe for I don't know how long. Finally, I focused my levitation magics, and picked up the one other item in the safe. A recorder with a single imprinted message. I copied it into my pit buck and started it. I didn't recognize the voice, but she sounded young. At least as young as Pinky Bell was now. Pear Tree. The raiders came back yesterday. They didn't take kindly to my daddy running them off last week with a shotgun, so this time they came in force. Mama made us hide in the upstairs bedroom and cast a spell over us to keep us from being seen. She made us promise to be quiet and still, but Silver Bell. My little sister has always been able to make beautiful music, through the tinkling of dozens of magical bells. We all adore it, but Silver Bell sometimes, when she's frightened or worried, the spell happens all on its own. She didn't mean to. It was an accident. The raiders killed Mama and Daddy. They killed them really slow and brutal. They made us watch. It was... I buried them by the end of the East Field, put up a couple planks as tombstones. I hate that they won't last long, but I can't carve their names into rocks. And Mama and Daddy deserve to have their names over the graves. Silver Bell has nightmares every night. Honestly, I do most nights too. And during the days, she just curls up silent-like, never crying, never smiling. I can't even get her to eat. I don't know what to do. I'm going to try taking her to Ten Pony Tower. I've heard there's a buck up there who takes in orphans. It's a long walk, and so I'm headed up to gather provisions from the neighbors. If I'm not back when you get here, please load up the wagon. I know I can't ask you to come with us. You have your own folks to take care of, but I would really appreciate it if you could hang around so I could say goodbye. You're the best buck friend I could have ever asked for. Love, memory. I sat there, stunned. Oh, sweet goddess Celestia. You shouldn't have listened to that. I turned with a start to see Pinky Bell. No. Silver Bell. Staring right into my face. It's not yours. This close, I got a much better look at that scar. Horrible realization hit me like ice water. Silver Bell was a unicorn. She'd cut off her own horn. I recoiled, backing into the open safe. You want it so much? Keep it. Pinky Silver Bell reached up to swing the safe closed on me. From behind her, Velvet Remedy's voice broke the air. You're not like Pinkie Pie. Pinky Silverbell froze, then slowly turned away from me. Still, she blocked the front of the safe, and I somehow couldn't bring myself to barge through her to get out. You're nothing like Pinkie Pie. Velvet Remedy spoke slowly, calmly. Her voice wasn't accusing now. It was mostly sad. You are, if anything, the opposite of Pinkie Pie. I watched the filly in front of me shake. Emotions seemed to rush through her as if they didn't want to stay or were eager to get out of the way so the next emotion could take hold. But what happened you don't bring happiness. When I look at you, all I feel is sad, Velva continued, her voice giving gentleness to her words. If Pinkie Pie were here to meet you, she wouldn't want to throw a party. Yes, she would! Velvet paused only for a moment. Maybe she would, but she wouldn't throw a party because she wanted to have fun with you. She would throw a party because she wanted to help you. Because he would make her very, very sad. What, what, what do you know? I know that laughter, real laughter, isn't forced. It isn't something you paint on to hide how you're truly feeling. Velvet Remedy walked slowly towards the filly, who was trapped between flying into rage and breaking down into tears. I know that you're very badly hurt inside. 
It's not some sort of hurt that can be fixed with a party. Or healed by my horn. By the time Velvet Remedy had reached the filly, Pinky Silverbell was shaking badly. What happened to your parents wasn't your fault. What happened to your sister wasn't your fault. To her sister. Suddenly, I remembered the three planks in the field. The last one crooked, like it was planted by someone smaller and younger who didn't manage so well. I thought of an older sister named Memory, trotting out alone towards the nearest neighbors, another farm probably a dozen miles away through territory being savaged by raiders. My heart broke. Yes, it was! And with that, Silverbell collapsed into wretched sobs. Velvet Remedy was there to wrap her head and a leg around the filly, giving her a mane to cry into. Well, that was shocking. I have no idea what the heck to make of what I just heard. Never mind. Instead of horror story, this turned into a sob story. Like, this turned into a... I have no idea what to say. I've said this before, but this story is really pulling against my emotions in many different ways. She was so ashamed of what happened that she cut off her own horn thinking it was her fault. She's been alone all this time. <sighs> well, anyway, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. And please leave a like, comment, do whatever. And tell me what you thought of this chapter. Because I have never... I, I've not read something like that before. Or heard something like that before. And... Anyway, guys. I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye.